All right. So I've heard a lifetime of stories from my dad and my grandma of what it's like to grow up in East Africa. And I have these memories from my childhood having lived vicariously through the sharing of those experiences. So although my dad is originally East Indian, he was born and raised in Tanzania, um, which, is home to the con <laughs> which is home to the continent's uh, tallest mountain and borders the largest lake. So coming from this background, I've been drawn to this region of the world. And I've always had this insatiable curiosity to learn as much as I could about the culture, the language, the people, the wildlife, and my family. Now, being a budding scientist and having interest in global health, I've had the opportunity to read in depth about some diseases, such as malaria, that are of serious consequence to not only Africa, but our entire world. And so, through my readings, I found out this wasn't just a region anymore. Even though I had never physically been to Tanzania, I felt in many ways this was part of my home. So I was struck by the absurdity of far too common fate. And I saw it swallowing up parts of a nation that meant so much to me. So I sought to do something about it. So two years ago, I co-founded a nonprofit organization based in Tanzania called Mission Against Malaria Society. And what's really specific about the campaign is that we focus on long-term awareness of malaria and prevention, while still taking into account some gender-specific obstacles in obtaining access to malaria treatment. For that reason, primarily our efforts are aimed towards women, um, children in boarding schools, and large families. So the challenges in combating a global health crisis like malaria proves to be incredibly multifaceted, branching out in all directions and fields of study. So, I'll start off to you by explaining some scientific challenges um, based on surrounding malaria and some surprising sociocultural factors that play a prevalence in the role of this disease. But before I delve into the scientific base of malaria, I'd like you first to imagine yourself living in the late 19th century, an era well before the time of antibiotics, and generally a difficult time for society at large. Patients at that time who were suffering from syphilis were actually purposely infected with malaria to alleviate some of the symptoms caused by syphilis. Now, what's really neat is that if they were given anti-malaria medication, both the symptoms of malaria and syphilis could actually be diminished. So the reason why I mention this is that even in the 19th century, we had some quite remarkable treatments for malaria. And now that we're in the 21st century, the main problem becomes not so much in finding a cure, but in making those treatments accessible to the people who need it the most, and in creating a vaccine to prevent it in the first place. So how is malaria most commonly spread? So there are essentially two ways malaria can be spread. It can be transmitted from a mother to her infant before or during delivery, or it can be transmitted through mosquitoes. Now, if you take a look at this image of the female mosquito, there doesn't seem to be anything unusual about it. It doesn't look sick. And that's because it's not. What's creating havoc is essentially what it's carrying. And that's a parasite called Plasmodium falciparum, which is Latin for, I've been around since the earth was cooling. I transmit, um, I try to use a high-wave mosquito salivary gland, and I can outwit any human vaccine ever made. So what this parasite does is it invades the red blood cells and degrades a certain tissue responsible for transmitting oxygen to all of our cells. So how does it really get there in the first place? Well, it begins with a bite. Now, unless you're taking a, sinking your teeth into a double fudge chocolate sundae, bites generally lead to some kind of infection or irritation. And in this case, within 30 minutes of a mosquito bite, the parasite has already infiltrated the liver and begun rapidly replicating. And two things can happen from there. Essentially, the parasite could continue replicating and release daughter cells into the bloodstream, or it can remain dormant for weeks, months, or even years later, triggered by unknown reasons. So, essentially, the uh, symptoms that appear are essentially flu-like at first, and it may appear like uh, fevers or chills. But if left untreated, what's commonly seen is something known as blackwater fever and essentially so-called because of a dark urine that results from massive destruction in red blood cells. So how can we prevent this from happening? The most efficient form of protection is a bed net, but that's not often feasible for many people living in malaria endemic regions, and neither are anti-malaria medication. What would be ideal is a vaccine, but there is none. So I turned to Dr. Brett Finlay, 
who's a professor here at UBC. And Dr. Finlay is known for a wide array of accomplishments. Um, in particular, when working on one of the 14 grand challenges uh, generally funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So part of his research in that includes finding very promising data for cerebral malaria. Now, cerebral malaria is a very specific form of the disease that results in a swelling of the brain. According to Dr. Finlay, creating a vaccine for this proves to be an Everest of challenges in itself, literally a game of having to outwit one of the most successful pathogens in the planet. So even if we do overcome this hurdle, the challenges we faced is who will pay for it? How can it be distributed to the people who need it the most? And what stage in the life cycle do we target? But vaccines are essentially only one side of solving a global health crisis like malaria. So I turned and had a chat with Dr. Vinay Kamat, who is a medical anthropologist here at UBC. Now, Dr. Kamat has done some quite amazing research based in Tanzania, and he's studied some radical shifts in malaria control strategies and what those shifts mean for people who are most severely affected by this disease. So what he found, essentially, is that there's two groups of people, those who can afford treatment and those who can't. Now, those who can afford treatment go on to buy the most effective, yet expensive, medication available, whereas those who can't are often left by no treatment at all, or medication that's inexpensive and ineffective, essentially. So essentially, we're seeing a group of people who go on and have to, have to pay the cost of the disease in more than one form. So if we take a closer look at a family that would be in this latter situation, we see that 32% of their family income would go towards the effects of this disease. Now, combined with the fact that malaria accounts for up to 50% of inpatient admittance, we see a regional health expenditure of 40%, having, leaving Africa to having to pay a $12 billion expenditure solely on malaria every single year. So, as you can see from these maps as well, we're witnessing a global health crisis that is partly fueling poverty itself all over the world. So clearly it's a development issue where the need for effective treatment needs to be distributed more efficiently. But as Dr. Kamat noticed, is that there is a significant sociocultural basis. Now Dr. Kamat's research, also worked uh, in, in Tanzania, looked at families who had guests in their household throughout the whole year. And even though they had these guests, they did not have enough nets to accommodate them in the first place. What he found was that these families were willing to take the physical risk of contracting the disease rather than neglect their relatives. So we need to see more community-based intervention programs that look towards increasing sensitivity and responsiveness to a disease where symptoms can be misdiagnosed and labeled as an ordinary fever. An example of a community-based intervention program is one in Tanzania where a group of street performers actually conveyed the educational message to use insecticidal bed nets all year round. Truly an inspiring act, especially for young children watching. Well, I'll then let you know a story of my own inspiration, how I came to work on this project and toward this cause. So I was fresh out of high school. And as you may know, it's a time of feeling quite liberated and yet having this newfound sense of responsibility. And I didn't quite know what to make of that responsibility at the time. So the summer before I came to UBC, I went to a leadership summit called the Global Youth Assembly. And that's a fantastic four days of inspiring speakers and meeting people who love to talk about world issues. And so at this conference, I was asking myself questions like, where would I see myself five years down the line? What would Canada be like? What would the world be like? And at the end of this conference, we had to sit in groups, and we had to write down our ideas, and essentially our action plan, of what we'd see of the world. Now, the energy at this conference was just so driven and so inspiring. And I literally, I wouldn't have been surprised if someone announced they wanted to be the next Dalai Lama. So at this group, we went around in circles. And so we had some people saying, yes, I want change. They're just so inspired. And we had another person saying, I want to make a difference. And another person saying, I want to end Alberta Tar Sands. So some people had some very specific ideals, and I was relieved to see that, because next it was my turn. And at that moment, all the ideas that were linked around my mind suddenly came to become more concrete. And I opened up to my group, and I said, I want to connect with you all. Because 
I have this vision, and that is to end one of the foremost causes of childhood death in our world. And so at the time, I understood that the skill sets required to tackle these issues are extremely broad and require a great sense of community involvement. So I did turn to my community, and I gathered a group of people whose careers range from medicine to mathematics to international education. And together, we formed what we have a mission against malaria society today. So 14 months ago, I had a chance to go to Tanzania and uh, work through this organization. And to date, we've supplied uh, malaria prevention supplies to over 600 families in Tanzania. And we've teamed up with the Tanzanian and international rotary clubs for future work. So I did have the opportunity to meet one of the great leaders greatly involved in the rotary. And without knowing that he was actually my dad's former high school principal. So for me, it was a great opportunity to meet a leader and connect with a Tanzanian-based organization. For my dad, well, it was just another day in the principal's office. <laughs> so the main project right now, which I'm really excited about, is making those educational resource programs come to life. So they focus on increasing sensitivity and responsiveness to rural Tanzanian schools. And so the ultimate goal, essentially, is to connect to foster an atmosphere of proactive youth and ultimately a generation of leaders who will extend their awareness back into their own communities. So conferences like the Global Youth Assembly and Terry Talks are essentially these forums where people share their ideas, their visions, their motivations, and prove that their ideas that were once shamelessly idealistic are exactly the opposite, wholly achievable. So I invite you all to connect connect with us, connect with each other, because the sooner we start doing so, the more peaceful, the more open our world will be. And I thought that was an idea worth spreading. Thank you. <laughs>